part two of William Gunnan's interview, Vietnam War C-130 pilot. Bill, um, were there any casualties in your unit? We, on the first year, just, just after we left after our first year, uh, we lost one airplane. That's a whole crew. Never quite sure what happened, if it was uh, enemy action or they had been hit by a SAM or a MiG, we're not sure. Don't think so, because we could see what was going on there. But they, they flew into the side of a mountain. And I, I don't want to say that was frequent, but that happened sometimes. Vietnam, uh, North, South Vietnam, is a very mountainous country, especially away from the, uh, the ocean. And if you didn't know exactly where you were, you could fly into a mountain. But remember, with our special operations uh, plane, we had very good radar. So we knew if we were below the mountains or above, if we didn't know the mountains were there, we could see it on our radar. So that, I think, was a factor. But yet we lost this one airplane. And they, they finally recovered uh, the remains uh, many, many years later. I think in the uh, the 90s. Oh, it was after the yeah, war. Yeah, and they they knew where the uh, the crash site was. Just never could. It was very remote, way up in in uh, northwestern uh, North Vietnam. Were you ever flying in actual combat? A few times. I guess the straight answer is yes. Can you recall any specific incidents you could tell me about? Specific what? Incidents that you Incidents. Can tell me. Um, well, the, the 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 big thing was uh, when you're up in in enemy country, wherever you happen to be, uh, you're you're you've got a conversation going with your electronic warfare officer, because he's going to be the one that's going to be able to see where there's activity. The the surprises are we found over there was uh, going into. Uh, strange fields and uh, or not even strange ones that have been established they would occasionally put a sniper on the approach end of the runway and then maybe two miles out and he'd wait there and as you're coming across he'd take these pot shots and uh, that that was always happening I mean that was just one of those things we, we found one base in uh, South Vietnam uh, Can Do they, they had a, a sniper there but he couldn't shoot. He couldn't shoot straight, and so we found out. We, you know, when you land, you're, you're talking to security, police, the perimeter. You know, how's things here? What's the condition? You want to know if it's a hot base or not? They said, "Well, we're 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 feeding this sniper." I said, Why are you doing that? Because he's so bad, we don't want him to leave because he can't hit a thing. He said, "At night, you can see the muzzle, bl you know, blast there, and and he's not hitting anything." So that's the kind of thing that would be a surprise. But with, with the MiGs, uh, we had all sorts of coverage. We, it wouldn't, they couldn't sneak up on you. Uh, and I, I got to think that they didn't particularly like to fly at night. They just, just weren't those kind of flyers. It was a, for, for them, the air war was a, a daytime activity. Being, being radio controlled uh, from the ground. After your year in the train, where did you go? We were supposed to have a one-year tour in Vietnam in the Trang. I volunteered for two extra months if they would guarantee I'd get to go to Europe. And they said, deal. So I stayed an extra two months. Because remember, by that time, you, you, you know, everything, every mission is a new mission. It's different. But you still felt confident. And so that meant that I was on somebody else's crew. You know, we, we were on different crews at that point, and that was fine. We, you know, we were, we were the guys that started the whole business, so it wasn't all that bad. And, and, and you, you, because you know your machinery and equipment and your capabilities, uh, you tend to fall back on that. So it's not, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? You know what you're going to do. So there's not that anxiety. So after those two additional months, then you went to Europe? I got to go to Germany. Uh, How long were you stationed there? Uh, off and on for 10 years. I love Germany. <laughs> I guess you decided to re-enlist. Did you 
decide to make the Air Force your career? Uh, at that point, you're, you're getting up uh, almost 10 years, and that's halfway for a 20-year career. So and, you and you decide are. that you were going to be a career? I did, but not thinking of it that way. I was still having a good time, just seeing the world, and, and that worked out. But uh, along those lines, uh, that was about the time the Air Force the stray goose, that was the first, you know, outside the country, the United States, they put those, uh, that, that squadron, Vietnam, then there was always a squadron in the States. So we were again the first to go to Europe to start up the special operations in Europe. So when you look at that, the way it's strategically located, you now have the world covered for so special, special operations. special operations in Europe, what did that entail? Same thing as Vietnam, except uh, there, we were kind of, uh, not kind of, we were on a peacetime operation in that we were, we were teamed up with the, uh, the Green Berets, the Special Forces, they had units over there, and their mission was to train all the NATO countries in special operations, Green Beret tactics. So they were teachers. And something I've just put together recently, you know, there was always the Green Berets, uh, there now is called a Delta Force. You've heard of that. And I always wondered, because I tell you, Green Berets are good, smart people, think on their own, and they can do. They know what the mission is, they, make, they get it done. That, that's simple. That's how clever they are. I always wondered, why would they go into a Delta Force? This is only me speaking now. But I think what, what the reason was, back then, remember the Green Berets were actually encouraged by John JFK Kennedy. He used them, I think, much like the Peace Corps, except they were military. And so they can teach the other ends of being military and, and all that goes with special operations. So they were always instructors teaching other countries, even though they had that capability, because at that time all of them had gone through Vietnam, so they were warriors too, and not just instructors. Once they got spread around like Europe, they were then purely instructors. There was, there was nothing going on hot where it was, you know, shooting war. And so that's what happened. And I think that's why they came back and said, we have to have a unit now that's Delta Force. They're, they're you know, like SEAL teams, that sort of thing. Right. Well, that was the other thing in special operations. When, when I first started in special ops with the 130s, the highest ranking officer uh, was mostly a handful of full colonels, and one Brigadier General, one star, and he was down in Florida, and that was it. Now today, there is a U.S. Special Operations Command run by a four star, and if you look at funding, which makes everything either grow or go away, Special Ops is highly funded. It's because that's the way you get things done. No nonsense, and it doesn't take many people to do it. It's not like a bayonet charge. It's a very intellectual game, outwitting the enemy. So that's what you see today. I think I answered whatever that question was back. <laughs> yeah, special ops in Europe. So then you, for 10 years off and on, you were in Germany. So that was until after the war ended. Oh my goodness, yes. Um, all right, so I know that, that you did some other very interesting things like the Sante Raid while the Vietnam War was still going on. Where were you stationed when that came about? Germany. That originated in Germany? We, we got a, uh, a, a by name, you know, we want you to come back to the States, do some uh, training with the Special Forces. Very innocent. What year was this? This, this was 70. This was in the summer of 70, 1970, July. Just you or your whole squad? Well, it was a combination because as I look back now, you know, having <laughs> the foresight yeah. of some experience, it was most of the crew, we had the original crew back when we first started, that SO1, and it was most of those guys. And you guys were all in Germany at this point? Yes. Most of us. Yeah. Most of us. Few weren't. But, but it was the nucleus of that crew. And, and having gone through the whole thing and, and talking to the, the planners up above who put it all together, they said, yes, you were, you were hand chosen. Why? You know, we were hoping to hear, you know, that uh, you had a good reputation, this and that. But the point was, 
they knew that we were the first. We had gone through grown up. We were, we were supposedly the smartest as you can be for the experience level of everywhere we've been. And so that's why that happened. And they wanted to be able then to tell, I guess it would have been Nixon then, that yes, this crew has flown in enemy territory, so they know what's going on. So you got a call to return to the United States. It, it wasn't actually a call. It was a very innocent, uh, uh, we called them Twixes, and it was a, a computer printout that they wanted this crew, you know, to show up. It was like the end of the week. It was it was quick, short notice, and it was a, it was from the commander in chief of the European Air Force Command. So that kind of got our attention, and as we said, not so much that it was from him, but they had our address. We thought we were kind of over here on the side, low key, with our little aero club. I say aero club at that point. Special Ops, special operations in Germany. We had our C-130s. We had the C-47, the Goonie Birds. That's a twin engine. Started out a hump flying. You remember that, India, Burmese, and then we had helicopters, UH-1Ns, Hueys. So it was like a private aero club for the flyers. It was wonderful. So here it is. This message came in from the commander in chief of Europe, USAF, and we're scratching our heads, you know. And they said to, not to mention anybody, just go go up, and you have to be down in Florida by the end of the week. So we were already on an exercise a fall exercise in uh, summer fall in, in England when they caught up with us. So they had, because they had this, because we were working again with the, the special forces, they had to be able to pull a whole crew out. Now they got some scheduling difficulties amongst the squadron, but they knew it was a high enough level they couldn't buck, you know, to do this. So they managed that and we, we couldn't, you know, believe because this was, you know, for our unit, this was the big operation of the year. Working with all, we, I mean, as I say, we worked with all the NATO countries, all the special operations. So it was, it was a wonderful exposure there. And as anything else, they do things differently. And so you learn. You're learning. How do you do that? How do you do that? And so that's what the whole thing was about. And that's why I think today NATO is so strong. We, we work with each other. And we actually keep an eye open. This is a better way to do something, and you learn both ways. So, if you were in England, did you just come from England and fly to Florida then? Uh, we we had to go back to to uh, Ramstein to get a new set of clothes and that sort of thing, and and, and you, you had to park a car somewhere. You had to take care of your rent. We were all renting, you know. Where did you go in Florida? So we went down to uh, Eglin Air Force Base, Florida. That's uh, Fort Walden Beach. And that's where we got to meet that one star, the, only, the, the leading general of special operations in General Manor, Leroy Manor. And they still didn't tell us what was going on, but they said, we, w we want to try some different things with the 130. You've all flown the 130, but we're going to do something special. What was special? Well, like we're going to fly, you know, normally a 130 lands at 125, 130 knots. We're going to fly this in the air at 105 knots. What do you think? Well, we all said, yeah, we can do that. Got back to the where we were staying and said, how are we going to do this? <laughs> Figure it out. So we had to get charts out, get air speeds and see what, what was real. In an airplane, the, the really thing that counts is the stall speed. And that's where the airplane will actually fall out of the sky. What we like to say is, you're in trouble in an airplane when it starts to vibrate. It's either going too fast, you're overspeeding, or you're about to stall going too slow. Keep it in between, everything is fine. So we figured out exactly what our weight was going to be, 130,000 pounds. And it turned out that our stall speed was 100 knots. The reason we had to fly that slow was we, we had to lead helicopters in, five hel six helicopters in, three and three. The H3, because it had 14 Green Berets on board, full of fuel, all their equipment, it could only fly 110. So 110 was the top number. Our stall speed was 100, halfway in between 105 knots. So we practiced in the daytime for a while just to get used to that. You didn't know what you were practicing for. No, we, we, some of us did because we had to plan for the real mission. Did 
did, when did you become aware of what the real mission was? Probably, we trained down there for four months. So I, I would say the second month. Because we, we had to put this all together. We had to end up then leading the six helicopters. And, and that was something too. We had two 130s involved. We never knew until we got to, uh, we, we staged out of Thailand because we didn't want to stage out of Vietnam because we knew Vietnam was full of holes, moles, and, and it would have been blown our cover. So we, we, we did it out of Thailand. The two crews to flying the 130s never knew until about two days before the actual raid who was going to fly the lead. So we would always practice both roles. The second 130 had to lead A1Es, the, the support fighters. That's a problem. When you were doing your training, were the C-130s training in Florida and the Hueys training somewhere else, or did you all train together? The, the crews trained together. When they actually deployed, the only two airplanes we flew were the C-130s that we trained in, and we took those over because that was the whole, you know, plane that was going to lead in and out. We had so that let's back up. up. When, you were, when you had been down there already training two months, then you find out what the mission was. What, what did they tell you your mission was? That it had entailed rescuing POWs. They didn't give specifics, uh, just in general. And then I, so I would... All you knew is you were going to fly somewhere in North Vietnam to rescue American POWs? Yes. And, and as any good, I say any good Air Force crew, because they weren't telling us, we were starting to do our own intelligence gathering. Where could we possibly be going? I remember we used to every Sunday go get a New York Times. What's hot in the world? And so it turned out that was the time when, when the Russians were bringing their nuclear subs in with the ICBMs on board. And when you flew over, the, we had the prison laid out there, uh, an Eglin on, the, on the, uh, the ground to replicate what the prison looked like. When we flew over, it looked down. We didn't know what it was. It, to us, when we looked at that, we had the pictures of the submarine pens that reconnaissance had taken in Cuba. We said, that's got to be those submarine pens. We're dropping special forces in there, and they're going to blow up the submarines. And we thought, that's great. <laughs> well, you were wrong. <laughs> yeah. And then later we found out that the, the Green Berets, because they knew they were going to deal with people, they thought that we were sure going to the Middle East, because even back in 70... The Green Berets didn't know either. No, no, for our own safety. But, but the thing was that they thought, because they're thinking too, and they said, well, you know, there was a couple of embassies. People were held hostage already. That, and I'd forgotten this. And they said, oh, yeah. That's, and so we know we're going into some, you know, embassy and bring out people that are being held hostage. We never connected the dots in that all of us had two, three tours, some of them, especially the Green Berets, over in Vietnam, in North Vietnam. In, so we were trained. We were already trained. We never thought for a moment we were going back to Vietnam. Never thought of And what was the biggest war going on for America? Vietnam. We, we weren't thinking that. We were thinking, we really were, because the bigger issue really was then Cuba, the Russians and their submarines. And that's a whole other issue there uh, in terms of what was going on there in Khrushchev. All right, Bill, um, we're going to show your PowerPoint presentation that you use when you make presentations to groups. Um, and that by using that, you can describe, uh, first of all, tell us about the training, what it took, what you did, how you prepared, and then details about the actual mission. So here we have a, a shot of the opening. Um, so this is your presentation about the uh, Sante POW raid where you, where you played a significant role in trying to rescue our POWs. So you go ahead and continue as you see fit. Uh, this is a, a slide presentation I put together after 30 years from the raid. raid happened on uh, November 21st, 1970. That was last century. The reason I did this finally, uh, through the years, we never really thought much about the raid because it was just another mission. You finish the mission, you move on. 
but I knew there was it was significant because it had to, it dealt with the POWs and uh, so I was sensitized. Remember the the, the raid took took place at two thirty in the morning, o oh, dark thirty, and you'd come across pictures in your travels that were raid associated. So as, as everybody else does, you have a folder, and, and that folder was raid pictures. And, and after 30 years, I realized I had enough there. I could probably do something with it. My, my original intent was to uh, put together a book for that time when the children were there grown up and uh, savvy enough to say, well, Dad, what did you do in that war? I mean, it's, uh, I, I knew I was getting old when my children came home from school one day and they were studying the Vietnam War, which lasted probably 10 minutes in their, in their lectures there in school. So that's when I sat down and got serious and uh, while the mind was still, <laughs> could remember back 30 years, put, to, put together a book on the raid. Uh, and th this was then a product of uh, the book in that with these pictures, uh, I go around different, doing different presentations, museums, uh, uh, reunions, uh, all sorts of gatherings, even Rotary Club. Uh, I've been to men's clubs. I haven't had ladies clubs yet. I don't know if they have them. But uh, we continue to go out and do presentations. So I, I went from the old uh, view graph slide on, on, uh, on a screen presentation to a PowerPoint, which you're about to see here. And that's what you're looking at right now. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll basically go through what we did how it happened, how we put it together. Uh, this is a uh, actual picture, a painting, done at the Air Force Museum, uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio. And it shows our 130, which we flew, and then the six helicopters, which we led into North Vietnam. Is that you in that 130? Uh, that is uh, yours truly in that 130. And this is our official patch for the Raiders. Uh, this was a, the first really true joint operation in Vietnam where we had Air Force, Army, and Navy participation. We've been trying to find that one Marine, but we cannot find him. We fi figured there may be a, a, a former Marine that's gone over the Green Berets, which just doesn't happen by its own nature. So we haven't found that, that fourth Marine there to, to be able to say it was a true joint uh, operation. So Nowadays, there were Green Berets in those six helicopters? Uh, the, uh, there were 56 Green Berets in, in the helicopters. Uh, the way they were spread out, these are HH-53s, the heavy helicopters. This is an H-3, small, because that helicopter had to land inside the prison compound, which is about 150 by 180 feet. Uh, in that helicopter, we had 14 gray, Green Berets, and then we had 20, and then we had 22. The other three were for bringing the POWs out. And they were also a backup if, if one of the airplanes, uh, or rather helicopters, had a maintenance problem, they had to drop out, they could be filled in. What you'll find on this raid uh, through the planning, we, we planned it for four, four months. We were down in Florida putting the whole thing together. We pretty much replicated everything so that if something were to go wrong, we'd had a backup for everything we did. And that's, that's the way we, we did it. So what was your planning like? So when you got to Florida and you didn't know what, what initially, what did they plan you? You had to practice the 105, but what other things did you do? It, it was basic in that we first had to figure out how to keep a 130 in the air at 105 knots. Uh, our stall speed was 100 knots and that's where the airplane truly would fall out of the sky. What we used to call it a concrete pool table. Uh, the helicopter, they had the, the green berets uh, the 50, uh, the 14 Green Berets, uh, that helicopter was full fuel and its max speed, full power, was about 110 knots. So doing the higher math, 100 knots, 110 knots, we flew at 105 knots. We each had a little play. What we found out when we were flying, putting it together, when he was up there and he's, he's actually flew the mission closer into our wing, he got what we call the draft position, like, uh, like race cars. And so they got right behind. We could actually bring him along with us. He gained about uh, 15 knots that way. So he had a lot more play. What we didn't want to do is, if you see this, this is a, a, a large uh, conglomerate of, of aircraft flying in one airspace. If we had to break out and then re rejoin for whatever reason, uh, we didn't want to do because that would let the cat out of the bag and they would, they would know there'd be a raid coming on. So we kept it close. 
uh, going in that way. Uh, as I said, there was a total of 56 Green Berets. If you're into history, that just happens to be, it's a coincidence, the same number of signers of the Declaration of Independence. How historic is that? So, putting the raid together, uh, the way I do this presentation is not by a lecture or a presentation per se. Early on, if you read here, what it says is, I really want to have questions. Don't save them to the end. Do them right now, because this way, we now get into a conversation or a discussion about the raid. And that's, that's, that, that way I find works the best, because at whatever level people are, that's the kind of questions you're going to get, and we deal with them. So the questions are answered right on the spot, and that, that now makes the audience that much more uh, knowledgeable of what's going on with the whole raid and the whole mission. So that works very well. As I say here, uh, please ask the questions, and then we have a real presentation. Any good raid, you're going to have uh, patches. Uh, this was our official raid patch. It gives us the Sante Raider and the date, 21 November 1970. And this is basic the definition of how the raid went. Remember I said that H3 was going to do a salt landing inside the compound and then we get the prisoners and get back out. That was just an idea only. We never actually planned to do it that way. That first, once that uh, H3 did the landing inside the compound, it was staying there. We're, we weren't going to bring that home. We were afraid it was going to get dinged and if we were counting on it, if the rotors were broken, it couldn't fly out. So that would be a, a hiccup there. So we didn't do it that way. We left it behind plan. We, once those guys were in there, got the prisoners, we're going to blow a hole in the, in the wall, bring them out for those other empty helicopters to pick up, take them back out. Uh, the patch on the right is the famous mushroom patch. Now I'm sure you know how mushrooms are raised in the dark with a lot of horse manure. Well, you see the letters down here. This, this was our crew that designed this. Uh, the navigator, the EWO, the electronic warfare officer, and myself, we were taking our birds across the Pacific, bored out of our minds. You're just up there straight and level, looking at clouds go by. So we got together and said, let's, let's do us our own patch. And so we did this patch. Notice our patch, because it was designed and, and actually made before the raid like a week before the raid. So there's no indication that Sante or a date involved. That's a neutral patch. It's been sanitized. Uh, the letters kept in the dark, K-I-T-O, and then fed on horse stuffings. And that's the way our handlers treated us. We were trying to figure out, they wouldn't tell us for our own safety where we were going in case we'd spill the beans with somebody else and suddenly the enemy was there waiting for us. They wouldn't tell us. Air Force thought we were going to Cuba with, with the, uh, the nuclear submarines from Russia were down there with their ICBMs, nuclear warheads. We thought when we looked down from the airplane going over the ranges where we had this camp laid out at the prison, it looked like uh, submarine pens. So the Air Force was convinced we were going to Cuba. The Green Berets, on the other hand, because they knew they were going to be dealing with people with hostages, they were convinced we were going somewhere in the Middle East to get people out of embassies that were run over. And I'd forgotten about this then. Now, in the training, though, did they set up the, your training in Florida? Wasn't that set up like the compound that you were going to fly into? It was. I have a picture later on here. It shows that. And it doesn't look like a prison compound. Oh. It looks like a building. It could be anything. And I'm sure they were told this isn't the main gate, this isn't the door, that sort of thing. And they knew somebody was going to come in on the helicopter because we, brought, we brought them in that way at night when we were trained. They did not know specifically what that was about. Other, the only thing they knew, they were dealing with people to be, to, to be rescued. Now when they talk about the Sante Raid, usually they talk about how the helicopters went in and they don't talk about the role of the C-130. So what was your role? Well, if you, if, you, if you go back to the first uh, slide there, it has a picture of the 130 in, in formation with the six helicopters. At that point, there was no such thing as GPS like we have in our, everybody has in our cars today. The, the 130s were used for their navigational abilities to be able to go in safely through all, it was like we called it tiptoeing through the tulips. We, we went through like a minefield. We had to stay away from the air defenses. We had to stay away from the MiGs. We had to stay away from the SAMs, the AAA, to get in there and safely get out. And so we led the way in. 
Those helicopters did not ha have the navigation capability to do that, that long range. We were in the air three hours to get there, and they couldn't have found the, and When the whole thing was said and done, you had to cross over that little compound and not left or right, you know, 500 feet. You had to cross over because the first guy had to land in the compound. So that's why the 130s were involved. There were two 130s involved. The first one, which led the helicopters, the second one then led A1Es. I have pictures of that. And they were for close air support for the Green Berets on the ground. If there was uh, opposition there, the A1Es could come in and do it. In fact, the one A1E did take out a bridge, which, which I'll show later on. So you so, were in the C-130 that we, led the helicopter. We were, we were the lead C-130. Once, and your job was to lead them there. Once you're at the compound, you stay in the air? Yes. Uh, and do you circle and wait for them exactly. for their mission, and then you're going to lead them back out? Well, the idea of coming back out, it didn't matter. <laughs> we just knew we were going southwest to get back to Thailand. So at that point, they didn't need precise, you know, in and out, because we were away from the defenses, and they knew where Thailand was. So that, that part was, we turned into a radio ship. I'll cover that a little later. So that's the story of the patches. Oh. Now that is the, that is the Sante prison. It's uh, probably failed to mention it's, it was only 20 miles due west of Hanoi. So that was uh, the enemy's capital. And it, it's much like if we today were to fly into Fairfax, Virginia, that's about how far away Fairfax is from Washington, D.C. So you can see at that point, uh, Hanoi was the highest uh, armed capital city in the world. And it was from Russia with love. MiGs, SAMs, which are surface air missiles, and of course the AAA, that's radar guided flak guns. So it was, it was dicey that way. As far as the prison, it was about 130, 150 feet by 100 and, uh, excuse me, 130 feet by 150 feet. Helicopter would land right in this area. This was the open area. Prisoners in these three buildings. There was a tower here, guard tower here, guard tower down here, and the only gate in and out was right over here in this corner, and there was a guard tower on top of that. So our route of flight to get over it that night was right across here, the diagonal, corner to corner. When we flew right overhead, we dropped flares, and that was to light it up. And it looks just about like this now. This is a flash picture of the model we used to train on. It's now out at the Air Force Museum at Wright-Patterson. So I'll go to the next slide. This was down in Florida where we had the prison outlined. It's on two by four stuck in the sand with sheets sent around to give it definition. You would have thought uh, that it would have been a Hollywood movie set to look like the Sante, the slide before. It wasn't, for the very reason the Green Berets didn't know where they were going. Remember, they thought they were going to the Middle East somewhere. So I'm sure they were thinking in terms of a building or a compound, but never of all of us, Air Force, Green Berets, did not think we were going back to Vietnam. And all of us had years of experience in Vietnam. So. The cover was very well done as far as uh, keeping the secret away from us. Now this is just a quick composite. There was, I counted, probably 116 aircraft total for a clandestine raid. And they were up in the air that night. Uh, keep in mind, this was at a time when Johnson declared for good faith with the North Vietnamese that maybe they would talk to us and we could make up something to be able to uh, release the prisoners. That he said, all right, we're not gonna bomb in North Vietnam. And so we had a two year stand down, no flights north. So this took place at the end of that. So they weren't expecting all this activity. And so later on, we heard with all the things going on that when they started to pick it up on their radar, the Vietnamese, uh, they thought this was a big invasion that they always really expected. But remember, we never did it that way. We, we, we weren't aggressive. We were, it was like fighting a war with one hand tied behind your back. It really was. There were so, so many this rules. represents 116 aircraft yes. that supported this mission? Yes, airborne that night. And uh, you can see there's two 130s. 
five H53s, H3, and then we have the uh, five A1Es for close air support. Uh, this big one here is a, a uh, the old Boeing 707 or an Air Force vernacular 135. There were tankers, there were Intel, there were uh, all sorts of uh, different uh, equipments up there on, on board these airplanes to help the mission in itself. Uh, we also had uh, 10 F-4s up and around Hanoi, and we had five uh, A1Es around Hanoi. And that was if they launched MiGs, these guys would be able to take care of that. Also, uh, with the 105s, they, could, uh, they had a, a mission called Wild Weasel, where once they got a SAM site activated electronically, they could send a missile down into the SAM site and blow the, you know, remove the SAM site from, from the operation. And then uh, we had Navy of about 60 aircraft. So there's a total there about 116 aircraft. Now this is what I call the uh, the chariot of Armageddon. This was our C-130 and I'll just go around it very quickly here and cover the different uh, pieces of equipment we had on board that made this a, a very good uh, special ops plane. Uh, the nose, very bulbous nose, uh, had a terrain following radar. That meant we could safely get down to 250 feet above the earth and train follow, staying down below the enemy's radar. Then the other uh, thing was that we could look out and if there was mountains coming up, this would allow us to clear that mountain and not fly into the side of a mountain, which had happened from time to time. Not with our airplanes, but with other airplanes. Uh, then you'll notice these are tip tanks uh, out here, external fuel tanks uh, to feed our engines. This one on the raid was dry. In its place it had a forward-looking infrared radar. That gave us an image on the ground and it was comparing warm spots and cold spots. So the image that came up was like the old black and white TV. You had gray, shades of gray and white and that showed us what was going on uh, on the ground and that really helped us because we had to be able to walk through all the defenses and get into Sante, go over that diagonal and then come back out safely. This helped us tremendously. Um, you notice the, the, the very dark color. It was a flat black, flat green. The paint was a special radar reflective paint. So as the radar energy came up and hit the plane, most of it, the energy was absorbed into the skin of the plane. And so the return back to the radar just wasn't there. It was enough that the, the radar operator, depending on his level of experience, would assume he was either picking up a flock of birds or some clouds, some weather radar up there going on. He wouldn't think of it as planes coming in. That was to our advantage, obviously. To not be seen, that makes you a lot more stealthy. The other thing you don't see here is back in the uh, belly of the beast is uh, our electronic warfare officer. We had little sensors all around the skin of the plane back in the tail up in the forward section here. That let, you, let the EWO know what kind of radar was looking at us, whether it was uh, long range radar, air traffic control radar, or a radar from a MiG, which is dangerous or the SAM missile coming up, they have radar there, and of course the uh, automated flak, those are radar controlled. So we had to know what was looking at because if we had to break left or right to get out of that area, that dangerous area, he knew which way was clear versus us turning into somebody else's radar. We didn't want to do that. So this was all in our favor, our advantage as far as getting in there safely. And remember the point was to lead the, air, the helicopters in and out safely, underline the word safely. How many prisoners did you expect to find when you got there? We expected to find 60, 65 prisoners. Now just before the mission launched, we had the names of the prisoners from about two years ago. The reason you might wonder, why would you have the names of the prisoners? Because the intel was that good. What had happened, even then, the Vietnamese were, were conscious about world opinion. And they really felt they were doing the right thing, defending against the invaders, the Americans. I don't know where they got that from, but that was for world opinion. They released some of the prisoners early just to make the world feel that they were very sympathetic and kind and lenient. 
one of the one of the prisoners in that bunch that was released was a, a, a gentleman by the name of, of Doug Hegdal. He was a seaman, and he had fallen off one of the the, the uh, Navy ships out in the Gulf of Tonkin during night launches. He was watching them launch airplanes at night, fell over the side. He was recovered by Vietnamese fishermen. They turned him over to the police. He ended up in prison. Turned out, Doug had a very accurate mind, photogenic, and he could remember names and numbers. And so he had memorized about 300 plus names data shoot down what they were flying and their name of course and what prisons they had been in because back then the, the V would sometimes not let the rest of the world know who they had prisoner so there were a lot of unknowns did they survive their crash or shoot down or were they held prisoner well this guy had these names and so when they when the Vietnamese were going to release some people our senior officers in prison made sure he was pushed out. It turns out Doug had a very good act where he was going around like the village idiot, for lack of a better definition. And the Vietnamese were kind of afraid of him, so they left him alone. He had free wheel around these different prisons he was in. And so he talked to the different people and find out who they were. And so that's why he had these 300 names. He was released early in, in uh, 69, 60, late 68, 69. There were about three of them that were released. They got him and they put him in a room, tape recorder, and it's like when you learn the alphabet real fast, you can't be interrupted, and they just let him dump, do a data dump, and he put all those names out there, and they found some that weren't. Well, in that group was this, this group from Sante, which he had known, and so that's why we knew a lot of people that were being held in Sante. Very, very perfect. And so, especially on the Air Force side of the cruise, we knew a lot of the the POWs, Did so it became personal. I knew one gentleman uh, who had gone through with uh, pilot training, and so at that point it came very personal for all of us, and it was one of these, we're going in regardless of what was going on. It was that kind of a driven thing now, where before it was just an exercise, which we'd done before, and it was just another exercise. Now that we knew names, it meant something. It when really meant something. When did you actually find out the names and that you were going in to rescue POWs? Some of the pilots, some of the navigators, the EWO, were told probably two months into training so that we could plan for the actual mission. We had to, to find the right documents, the right information, the right intelligence. We found out about the names of those being held there probably two nights before we went on the raid. It was that quick and we said, by the way, look at these names, and boy, that was, that was well read that night. And sure enough, a lot of people knew a lot of those folks there. So that was very worthwhile. So. This is the, uh, the only of all those 116 aircraft, the only ones that had to be refueled in flight that were on the immediate raid was the, uh, the helicopters. Where are the helicopters? Uh, H-53 here. This is, this is almost identical to the one that went on the raid. H-53, 14 Green Berets. And you can see off that this is a tanker 130, not our Special Ops 130. They have a big radar so they can find around them what people are coming in to get refueled, they can help guide them in with that radar. But you see the two drogue chutes coming out on either side of the wingtips. And then he, of course, with his drogue, picks up and takes on fuel that way. Uh, what I was going to say, uh, 14 Green Berets, and if you know anything about Green Berets, they come well equipped when they come to a fight. All their weapons, all their kits, everything like that. Plus, since they were going in the prison, they had to have, uh, we decided from the, uh, the flight surgeon, baby food would be the best for the prisoners because we didn't know what condition their their uh, their stomachs were in from from fish heads and you know spoiled rice and that sort of thing so they had all that plus these helicopters were just refueled and so they were heavy. How did they refuel the helicopter? Uh, I have a chart to show that it was up over Cambodia just before we went in and they took on you know the big big load to go in and be able to come back out uh, and, and they did that we did this this whole thing was practiced uh, for uh, about a thousand hours of flying time. And there was never an instant, never a ding wingtip or a, a rotor blade. And you can see how close this is. That's about how close we flew you with the formation. refueling also? No, we did not. They did. That was part of, I mean, they that's did, their normal. They practiced every Yeah. Every and what was different 
we did this uh, this uh, refueling at night, radio silence and no lights. So that was the the, the new part of it, in, in terms of getting it done that way. So we'll go on. This is what it looks like when you're refueling or close to a 130. This is inside an H53, and you can see the uh, the pilot here with his stick. And there's a 130 up there in front of him. You see how big that is in his windscreen. It's up close and personal. And, and that's, that's, that's the way we did that. And this, as I said, these are one of these many pictures that you finally come up after 30, 40 years of keeping your eye open. Now this is an actual picture of our formation over Florida when we were fl flying it. Uh, there's the H3 in very close to our wingtip. In fact, he's behind the wing. And what was interesting because of the thin skin of, a, of an airplane, a 130, uh, you could not only hear the rotor blades going around, but you could, with your feet on the rudder pedal, you could feel the vibration. So you knew when he was in the right position, you hear it and you could, you could thump it. We also had the loadmaster in the back looking out and calling when he was in, but we already knew he was in because we could feel he was in. And then the other, uh, other uh, H-53s out here uh, and that's the way we flew that night. Remember, we're crawling along at 105 knots, so it's all very slow. The reason we could do 105 knots was because we put the flaps down 70%. That we found, looking at the charts, uh, gave us all lift and no drag in the back. So we were getting pure lift, and that's why we could do it safely. Okay. This is the second 130. It gives you an idea of our paint scheme and you can see the flaps down here on the trailing edge of the wing and then you have five A1E's now people look at that there's only four the number five A1E took that picture that's how we have it so this is an actual photo from the training in Florida this is still down in Florida because when we actually uh, transitioned and then flew over to Thailand where we flew the mission out of only the 130's went and we got all inland assets that's all the airplanes and that in itself is a story because what we had to do that to get the, the airplanes and some of the crew that flew along with us, uh, we had a letter from the Chief of Staff of the United States, General Ryan. And the letter read something to the effect that whomever hands you this letter will want something or request something. Give him what he needs. If you can't, call me. Had his phone number. General Ryan, Chief of Staff, USAF. Three or four General Manor, General, uh, Colonel Carl Jav, and, and another gentleman that I know of, went over to the bases in Southeast Asia in Thailand to get those five A1Es, all the helicopters. And the, the thing that was very interesting, that H3, that did not come back because we planned not to, because we knew it was going to do a hard landing inside. We call it an assault landing. The Green Berets call it a crash landing. We knew it was going to be hard on the airplane, so we didn't want uh, the aircraft, so we didn't want to use uh, count on it coming back out. So when we picked that airplane up, they said it was a, a sight out there on the ramp because they had to lighten it for all that 14 Green Berets, all their gear. They had to take everything non-essential out of that plane. And so they're just ripping it out because our guys knew this plane isn't coming back. There's that poor American crew chief trying to keep track of all this stuff we're ripping out. We're not even being very gentle with it. And he, and if you know a crew chief, he's worth his salt. He loves that airplane. And he gives that airplane to the air crew on loan. You better bring it back. We couldn't tell him, son, don't worry about it. It's not, we couldn't, that would blow the cover. So there he is trying to keep track of all that equipment that's been pulled out of his bird. So that was a nice little side light on that. All right. That's the, uh, the aft end of an A1E. And, the, and what we point out here is if you'll notice all these hard points along the wing, these are fuel tanks here. The A1E was a good air, close air support because it could call bombs, it could call machine guns, it could call marker beacons, uh, that, that's a, a white phosphorus for marking a uh, jungle where somebody else can drop ordnance. And so loaded up, uh, it, it could carry, the expression was, it could carry everything but the kitchen sink. It was known as the flying dump truck, it, it hauled so much. Later on in the internet, and people have seen this from time to time, 
Uh, the Navy did take this one step further. They had some A1Es also. And they, down in the bowels of one of the carriers, they brought up a commode, porcelain, and strapped it to the wing and dropped it somewhere in North Vietnam. And I'm wondering today, there still may be some Vietnamese are wondering what was that secret weapon all about? It's just nothing but shattered porcelain. Uh, again, bored people doing something to make, make time, and that was one of them. Uh, what I want to point out on this, this slide, this is very interesting. Uh, we, we did the raid on a Friday night. We were originally scheduled, scheduled for a Saturday night raid, 24 hours, but there was a typhoon, which we call a hurricane, coming in from the South China Sea. If you notice, you see the circular rotation of the clouds? That was just the leading edge of the clouds starting to come in from that typhoon. So we moved the raid up 24 hours. Uh, I took this picture because we had to go over and check out all the in-country uh, assets of the planes. So I was, I was able, as a, as a multi-engine driver, to get to fly along with an A1E. So I took that picture and never realized until later on that was the beginning stage of the typhoon that made us fly 24 hours early. So there it is captured that way. All right. Now this is uh, North Vietnam, which is outlined in the black. You can see where Sante is, you see where Hanoi is, that's about 20 miles, air miles direct. You can see our route of flight in. We were down here in Tok Le, which is uh, Thailand, Bangkok is right down here, uh, Laos, Cambodia. The refueling of the hel helicopters took place right in this area. Then if you know your geography, uh, six, eight thousand foot mountain chain all the way down North Vietnam into South Vietnam, all the way down to the tip. So going through this area, we were down in the valley, so radar could not paint us. So we were, we were clean that way as far as surprise. But once you get out here, we call this the Red River Valley. And that is as flat as a pool table. And so we had to get down real low to go on over across to, uh, to Sante. Now you notice uh, we have a line here called the, San, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You notice it's coming out of North Vietnam, going into South Vietnam, through these other countries here, Laos, Cambodia, and then feeding the flames. Also, there was another blue line out here. It seems uh, they, they had a Ho Chi Minh water trail also, and they would load up Chinese junks up here in Haiphong, their only their major harbor, North Vietnam, and then bring it along here in uh, the South China Sea, Gulf Tonkin, into South Vietnam, and then resupply from the, the seaside. I met, I knew this, I found this out. I met a, a naval officer at a uh, symposium, and uh, he, he said, "Yeah, I was over in Vietnam. I, I made the assumption he's uh, on one of the aircraft carriers." He's no, no. He says, "I was on a submarine." And I stopped, I said, submarine? I thought, I said, Vietnam was a land war. We had air on top of submarine. What did you do? He said, we would challenge those junks coming south. And when they didn't, and they never listened to us, and you could tell they were really weighted down heavy with, with the uh, supplies, we would take, and then on submarines then, on, on the bow they had a uh, cable cutter, and that was pretty sturdy. And they would take and go in and ram those junks on the side, they would break open like an eggshell and drop all the supplies uh, on, on the South uh, China Sea in the Gulf of Tonkin. He said, if you're ever into scuba diving, go up along that stretch from Da Nang North. He said, we put a bunch of uh, junks down to the bottom. There's, there's all kinds of you know war trophies down there if you like. And I said, well, how long are you doing? I figured maybe five years. We did that 10 years. So there's a lot of stuff down there. That's how long that war is going and being fed and it, my summary of the Vietnam War actually is uh, when, when you, uh, the Vietnam War was all about when one superpower goes and fights against another superpower in somebody else's country. It was the U.S. versus Russia and Vietnam was the laboratory. And if you look at things that were going on both sides, that's what it was. We were learning things. So that's Vietnam. All right, now. On, on uh, our, our route in to Sante, we were just coming through the mountains and our friends in the Navy, they always had, it was called Yankee Station. They were, they were, they were based out here, there were always three aircraft carriers on station. 
They launched about 65 aircraft that night and flew over 10, 20, 30,000 feet up here around northeast of uh, Hanoi just to be seen. And the whole purpose of that was to get all their defense radars looking out to the east while we're coming in from the west, so to speak, the back door. And that worked very good. Uh, the, we Later on, we, we, we found out they really thought that night with those 116 aircraft, including the Navy, the Vietnamese thought this was an invasion that was going to end the war. And so we heard a lot of their leaders got in whatever they could get in, vehicles, and went north into China so they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't be captured. Because they knew they were doing, I think, doing things wrong and didn't want to have to stand and, and explain them. The other thing was we heard one of the airplanes that was taking somebody up north uh, was such a rush takeoff, it crashed on departure, and so there were some people wiped out on that one. So there were a lot of side things you'll find later on here that happened we never even planned or thought would happen because of the raid. All right. Now this is the last five miles into Sante. Hanoi's over here, 10 miles. Remember, we have the uh, the 10 air, uh, F4s up here and then the five uh, 105s, the thuds flying up here for MiG suppression and, and for any SAMs that were coming up. We're leading the helicopters right about here. Uh, we had to drop them off because we had to go ahead. We had three things to do over, over Sante. We flew over the compound. We dropped parachute, four parachute flares. That, that gave the equivalent of about a million candle power. It's like the sun suddenly coming up in the middle of the night, 2.30 in the morning. After we did that, we did a right descending turn, came back out here. We dropped what's called their uh, firefight simulators. They were nothing more than cardboard boxes with firecrackers. When they hit the ground, they started going off. What we were hoping for is to cause that diversion. We knew there were a lot of barracks there with North Vietnamese regulars that were going to be going down into South Vietnam. And so we knew they were all around the area. And so if they were, they would come to where they thought there was a battle and not go to Sante. We wanted to keep that light as we could of, of enemy resistance. So that happened. And now here it's called Bomb Simulator. We had on board two napalm bombs. It's probably the first time uh, a 130 ever dropped napalm. It wasn't for defensive purposes. It was for uh, an anchor point for the A1Es to hold over. Once, once the, uh, the napalm came out, parachute, put it in the vertical, it went down, pooled, and then burned for about 45 minutes. The A1Es could come in and then hold over that bonfire. No one's going to put that out. We tried it in Florida. It lasted about 45 minutes. So we had two of those. Uh, what I knew, normally don't talk about the second napalm got hung up, and we were a flying bomb for about probably 10 minutes. I mean, that was the only point where we were all doing just dumb, crazy things. I was hunched down in the front seat like I felt, if, if it went off, it's going to go over me. We had been cooked in there like a pizza oven. But anyway, we didn't know how to, what had happened. We had cardboard with, with a uh, jerry-rigged, uh, uh, like a cradle in there where the... Uh, napalm rested. We're on this cardboard, uh, not cardboard, uh, plywood. It was on uh, roller uh, uh, skateboards like, like you have in grocery stores for getting uh, groceries around. And so the idea was to push that off. Well, that uh, uh, plywood, because of the humidity in Southeast Asia, 100%, warped it and they wrapped around those uh, skate wheels so that it wouldn't roll. And so there we are pushing. We had the loadmaster, one of the engineers, they're all back there pushing, wouldn't leave. So we're saying, what are we going to do here? We're, we're, we're a bomb. We're a flying bomb, you know. And so we find inside, push, push forward on the nose, on the control. That would get that thing to rise up and it would float, like in, you know, zero gravity. And when it did that, push. And so we did it, thing floated up and everybody pushed it out. It disappeared. Now, if you'll notice here, if you swing back, this lake is where that second napalm went into. And it was a good thing because had it gone out, there would have been another bonfire where it shouldn't have been, and there may have been confusion. So we lucked out again of what, what didn't happen. So then after we dropped that third one, our, our plan was then 
to go ahead and fly up here, getting this holding about 6,000, 8,000 feet, just outside of the defenses from Hanoi, and we turned into a radio relay ship so that we could talk to the people on the ground, they could talk to us, we could talk back to South Vietnam where General Manor was, and then he could communicate back to Washington where they're watching this to see as it goes down. Much, if you remember, like the, uh, the recent bin Laden takedown. Same idea. Uh, we like to think that the Sante raid was the, the flight check for the bin Laden takedown, because it was the same principles, basically. Surprise, night, helicopters, and a compound to land in. So, coming in, remember we're only at 105 knots. We leave the helicopters, they, we gave them a final heaven, heading, 073, and then we pulled away from them, pulled up, we were at 1,200 feet, and got up to 125 knots, so now we're a real flying airplane again, and then flew on in. What we'd never seen in, in practice, in training, was when you're flying that way, look where you're looking, right out here in Hanoi. We could see the night lights of Hanoi. And for us, at least up front, said, this is real now, gentlemen, that's Hanoi up there. Woo! And that's, that's exactly the way it was, and that's exactly the reaction. This is real now. Up to that point, it was the same thing we were practicing in Florida. So then the helicopters, they, they flew on in to, uh, to Sante. Now, let me get another, another slide here. The napalm, this is a T-33, one, one of the birds we trained in. I show this merely for the example. This is an external fuel tank, a tip tank. That's about 13 feet from, from the uh, pointed end to the feathered end. And that's how big the napalm, and we had two of those on board. All right. Now, this is where it gets a little intriguing again. Again, one of these things is not planned. Here's Sante, our run-in heading. That night, we had wind out of the northwest. Remember, we left the helicopters on their own devices to get that last four miles into Sante. Well, apparently, with the wind, they drifted southeast. See, this says secondary school. We all knew about it as the air crews. We talked. We don't want to go to the secondary school because it kind of resembled a compound like Sante. Well, wouldn't you know, the helicopters drifted down enough that they picked up the compound. And the first one went in thinking it was the compound, but at the last minute realized it wasn't the compound. Pulled up. The second guy went in and landed because they were shooting by now. And so they, I, I understand it. It's, it's a very natural mistake. They're shooting, therefore they're, we've arrived at the objective. I got to land and put my Green Berets out. And he did land and the Green Berets left. So now we're 120 less Green Berets. The rest of the guys went on through here, around and came up to Sante, because remember, we just had dropped four parachute flares. It was lit up like the Statue of Liberty. And so they were able to come back and get right back in like nothing had happened. I found out about this 35 years later when some of the Green Berets were asking me on the run-in, what was that big building where they were firing at us? And we in the 130 were thinking there was no big building, it was out in the, the rice paddies. So we got a couple of Green Berets, we got a couple of helicopters, we got the 130 guys, and we said, let's figure this out. And that is what happened. They had drifted south, and that's what the Green Berets, they were firing at the secondary school. What instead happened of to that team of Green Berets so, that landed? What happened was, as soon as they landed, they knew it was wrong, because you see up here, this is the uh, branch of the Red River, and it's on the back side. Down here, there is no, this is a road here, and there was no water. So they knew right away, we're at the wrong place. And so even, and even the helicopter pilot, once he got back up and he's looking up, he sees our flares, he says, oh, they're at the wrong, and he was already started back in. They were only out of the game for about five minutes to eight minutes, because it's only like uh, eighth of a mile from here up to Sante. It's, it's, it's not very far indeed. So they, they recovered, got back up, and, and continued. So the, the, the H3 did the landing inside the compound, and the other two landed just south with their green braids, and this guy caught up. The reason we chose Sante was because with this river, of, we, had, we had the choice of ten prisons to raid that night. We chose this because there's a bridge here and there's a bridge down here. 
you knock those two bridges out and you've just turned this into an island. There's no way for people to get in. Very well protected. So that's why we chose Sante. So I think what happened, the A1Es took out this bridge and the Green Berets took out this bridge that night. Now that's just a picture of a C-130. You see the black color screen, black and green. You can just barely see the ramp open here, ramp and door, and that's where all the flares, the firecrackers, and the napalm came out of the 130. That's just for strict, that was not on the ray, but just, and you can tell it's so high up. Uh, we were down low, 1,200 feet. Now, this is a, a drawing of the prison. Remember, 130 by probably 155 feet. One gate, guard tower, guard tower. Prisoners, these two buildings, and this building. Now, the sequence, once we got all the helicopters back lined up and coming over the right compound, uh, the very first helicopter was an empty H-53. They have Gatlin guns on board, three of them. The expression was we had to neutralize the two control towers. What that means is they had those Gatlin guns and they sprayed both those control towers. And this one, they said, was so neutralized it, it was cut in half, caught on fire, and fell inside the compound. Because everything over there is made of either bamboo or thatch or wood. They had tracers. And so it ignited all that stuff. So once he was done with that, then the actual H3 was going to do the landing, came over the, the, the wall here and landed right in this area, which he did. 14 Green Berets out, took immediate control. The reason we did it that way, if we'd have gone on the outside and tried to blow a hole in the wall and go on the inside, we felt that the guards would have started to shoot up the, uh, the prisoners by that time. So it had to be middle of the night, drop in and out of the sky, immediate control. Nobody's hurt. And that's the way it worked. So then the other two helicopters with the 20 and 22 Green Berets landed here in the south. These were uh, surrounded by uh, rice paddies, so they're, they're working a little water there that way. And then we, we went on through down south and back out with the napalm and then up outside of uh, Harm's Way. All right. Now this was a, uh, a, a, a velvet painting of the H-53 leaving out the green braids. You can see our flares. There's actually four. And you can almost see our plane right there making a turn. But somewhere along the way somebody made this up and by just describing it. Because this is 2.30 in the morning. No one's taking pictures. These are, these are made up. But very accurate when I hear from the green braids. And then the uh, the H3 that landed inside the compound, this is along the walls here where the POWs are. You can see the people running to their position. And this is very interesting because uh, if you go back to a re we do a reunion every three years. And we still sit there and look at this picture and our guys can still remember, well, that's you, that's me. Actually, I was over here to the left a little more and this guy was over here. What's interesting, you see this uh, gentleman here on his knee and he's got a megaphone. And he's, he, he basically says, uh, we're Americans, we're here to save you, keep your head down, we'll be in in just a little bit. And he released. Now you hear how quiet it is in here? That's the way it was that night. And this is where the rest of the story comes into play. The prison was empty. There were no POWs in there. Another twist. So what really happened was right about in this position here, there was a well that fed the, the prison for the prisoners and the guards. It went dry. Even though it was right next to a river, must have been a different water plane, the well went dry, they couldn't support the prisoners, the guards, they moved them. Some people say, well, they moved them just before the raid. Not true, not true at all. They moved them back when we were just putting the raid together in July. Remember, the raid is in November. So they, the first question, well, well, why didn't you know that? Well, we were watching. We had SR-51s, that's the spy plane, flying high overhead, 30,000 feet, taking pictures. And we'd get pictures every two weeks or so. And you could always see activity within that prison. Uh, you could see paths going to the three buildings we knew where the prisoners were. 
and it just in the mindset was it's a prison therefore there are prisoners there's paths apparently why they're not out like they used to be is they must have been being punished and what that meant they would keep them in prison 23 hours a day and just at night let them out for an hour to do a little laundry a little clean up whatever and that was it back in prison where before they they, they had time they go out and congregate in in the prison yard just to get fresh air exercise do laundry that sort of thing so it made sense we were going to a prison and we were going to get the prisoners that's now, there were no prisoners there were there guards still there there were guards there and they put up some resistance but from what I understand from the Green Berets, they were as shocked as anyone can be. They said they saw people running away from them with a perfectly good AK-14 around their neck, and they're hightailing it, one of these, and screaming in fear. So that's that's how we knew it was a surprise raid that way. Did the Green Berets immediately figure there were no prisoners oh, yes. when it was so quiet? They were expecting, after he made that announcement, we're here to keep your head down, he said that the normal thing, what would have happened, there would be cheering, there'd be applause, uh, I'm in here, come get me, we're ready to go home, all that kind of just, you know, like an American baseball game. None of that. And that's when the guy, he said, uh, uh, Dick Meadows, Green Bay, he said, my heart dropped, he said, this isn't good. Later on, for all the right, for all the wrong reason, it was the right thing to do that they weren't there. Just, just first of all, because the raid took place right under their noses, there wasn't a thing they could do about it. Think about it. Think that the, the Fairfax. If a foreign country went into Fairfax, we'd go crazy. Same with them. So they had, we, we, we learned later on they had a top-down uh, review at Sante. Uh, one of the first things he said, the, 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 the camp commandant, oh, he said, we, we knew about the raid, that's why we moved the prisoners. But the other thing was, uh, I didn't cover it, but that, that, that helicopter, the last man out then, we had a satchel charge and blew up the helicopter because we didn't want them to use parts on their machines. And also, for some naive reason, we felt that if we blow it up, they wouldn't know it was an American helicopter. So, you know, who's in the war over there? So with that, you know, they, uh, we heard also later that some of the uh, gu surviving guards, I'll put it that way, took credit for shooting that helicopter down. Very clever where we landed it and blew it up. So that was some of the, the side effects of that, that whole raid. Uh, let me just go on here. Now this is from the North Vietnamese archives. And this was the day after the raid. Remember I said we blew up the helicopter. You're looking at the, the wreckage. Hard to say that was a helicopter except the rear rotor and the blades. This was the, uh, the west wall when we came over. You see some of the Vietnamese there, but really that did a, a number on that helicopter and they're doing parts inventory. And the other one, that's the main gate over here and that's the little, uh, the guard tower on top. These are actual pictures and that's the only thing that, that really looked like a helicopter was left behind. Uh, we, we call this the Raiders calling card. I always felt, you know, in hindsight, we should have left a big American flag stuck there in the dirt as our calling card. But I tell you, a Sikorsky aircraft works very well too. And uh, this was then, they, they were kind of sorting things out. And you, you notice the three helmets here. Those three crewmen that flew that uh, helicopter in for the assault landing in the compound, once that landed, they, they were done. They were no longer flyers, right? So they, they, they tell me they, they had AR-15s, it's like a, a, a carbine there. And, and the Green Bray said, you guys just go over and stand along that wall. And, and if we need you, we'll, we'll ask for your help. Otherwise, stay out of the way. But more importantly, I don't know if you can see this right in here. You see that bullhorn? Yes. That's what they used when they were talking to the, you know, when they first landed, we're here to help you. Keep your head down. That was it. So there the Vietnamese had this to go, go all through and figure out what, what, what is this all about. Now that the question that comes up is uh, the Vietnamese always knew that prison was empty. So in their mind, they're thinking, why would the Americans raid an empty camp, an empty prison? They had an answer for that. They said, this was a practice raid. They're coming back tomorrow or the next day. 
So because of all this speculation, those other 10 prisons we didn't raid, the other nine, uh, they brought all those prisoners into Hanoi, some in the Hanoi Hilton, the famous prison there, and put them in there. They ran out of prison rooms and space, and so now prisoners were allowed to mingle. They could now talk and communicate, and this was the best thing could have happened. And by that time, they were figuring out, because some of the guys that were in the prison there at Sante were moved only maybe eight miles up the road, they knew that night because there was a lot of stuff going on. This, uh, Sam's were starting to be fired. There was a lot of noise on the ground, AAA. They didn't know what was going on. They knew it was something big and they knew in the direction it was happening. They said, that's over at Sante. Gentlemen, I think we missed our ride home. It was that, but it was a good thing because they said, ah, at least they tried. Because think about it, six years, eight years, they've been told you've been forgotten by the American, your brothers, your compatriots. Not true, this was firm solid proof they weren't forgotten. And so they were just ecstatic. They were just wonderful. This is great. And it scared the living daylights out of the Vietnamese. They said from then on, these guys had full battle gear because they were thinking there's going to be an invasion. We just never in that kind of a war. Remember, we were always there, advisors to help the South Vietnamese. It wasn't our war that way, really, but yet we were active in a lot of parts of the war. So that's why it didn't happen. Now, this is a recon shot taken the day after the raid. You see the labels, burn barracks. You can see here, this is Sante right in this area. And you can see there's a rotor blade. There's a, uh, the, the, where the, the hulk of the, the, the machine actually burned up after it was blown up and labeled that way. And at the time, this was probably a top secret picture. I got this picture at one of the Connecticut flea markets. It was in a box, you know, transportation, aviation, trains. There it was, pay the dollar. And that's, that's the, the star of my, my slideshow because that says it all. I was down in Florida doing this presentation. A gentleman up in the front row stood up and said, I took that picture. Come on. He had taken the picture, SR-71. And, and so it, it it's like closed loop again, come back around of that happening. So, I, of course, I, I right away I, I challenged him, what were you flying? SR-71. You got it. It was true. So th that's, that's the fun I've had with this presentation, these different 